so hopefully you've had some rest and some nourishment to start the afternoon. So this afternoon I wanted to talk about another aspect of letting go, or an aspect of the Dhamma which helps in the letting go, and that is the Buddha's teaching on not me, not mine, not a self. So that's called anatta in Pali language. You might know the word Atman from Hinduism, which means soul or self, which implies a something permanent, like a permanent essence that runs through, almost, in the background of everything else. But the Buddha was very clearly pointing to the truth of non-self, and sometimes that can be a little bit confusing for people, but it essentially means that, it doesn't mean there's nothing here, he says, because a rising is seen, but it doesn't mean there's something here, because passing away is seen. So it sounds very zen, but what that points to is more that what we take to be a self is actually a process. It's a conditioned process of cause and effect. So things arise and then they pass away, whether the body, the mind, or various aspects of the mind. Everything is in a kind of constant flux. Yeah? So when the Buddha talked about dependent origination, he wasn't talking about the process of a person continuing and, and going from life to life. So he wasn't saying there was some being that is reborn again. He was just saying that there's a process that continues on the basis of cause and effect. <coughs> that might all sound a little bit intangible and difficult to comprehend, but one of the ways I like to think of it is um, not mine, rather than not self, or that there's nothing in here. Just have the sort of perspective that nothing belongs to me. Nothing, I can't own or control my experience. Yeah? So another um, very interesting paradigm that the Buddha talks about is to explain the body-mind phenomena in terms of what he calls the five khandhas, which can be translated as components of existence. Yeah, I quite like that, more than aggregates, which sounds like some kind of concrete ingredient. <laughs> so if you think of it as components of existence, what composes your existence? You know, we're made up of the body first of all, this corporeality. Yeah. And the Buddha says that um, just as you wouldn't say to somebody who was sweeping away the leaves and the sticks from a, from a park, you wouldn't say, oh dear, they're, they're sweeping me away, you know, when they take the sticks and the leaves away. You just say, okay, they're taking the leaves away. In the same way, he says, this body doesn't belong to us. So when we see our body you know, suffering or when we die, they're not taking me away, they're just taking these aspects of nature away, yeah, earth to earth, so to speak. So he says, if you can see things like that, that could be for your benefit and welfare for a long time. Because yeah, it's when we cling and we don't want things to change that the suffering arises. Yeah. And he was saying that everything is a process and in a constant uh, state of decay, basically, state of decline. It's very easy for all of us to see that who are over about 30 years old. <laughs> you know, things start to break down. Yeah. So that's the body element. And then he talked about Vedana, which is, um, can be translated as feeling or sensation, experience. And this is all our aspects of experience, which are basically pleasurable, um, unpleasant, or somewhere in between, so neutral experiences. And again, the Buddha was saying in the Anattalakana Sutta, the discourse on non-self, that if these things were a self, we'd be able to say, may my feeling be this way, may it not be this way. Yeah. So that implies that we'd have some kind of control over it. But because it's not a self, because it doesn't belong to us, we can never say, may I only have pleasant feelings, may I not experience unhappiness. You know, may my bone be calm when I want it to be calm. We can't say that. And because of that, it's suffering. So he says to his monks, you know, is what can't be controlled, is it happiness or suffering? And of course they say, it's suffering, venerable sir. And then he said, well, can what's suffering be taken to be me or mine or belonging to me? And then they say, no, that's not possible. I mean, if you want to, you can call it you, but what good does it do? If you can't keep hold, you can't keep something with you, you know, and you can't change it to make it the way you'd like it to be. Yeah. You all look a bit depressed. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe sleepy. <laughs> but I'm not trying to control you, okay. <laughs> 
Yeah, and then the next component of existence the Buddha mentions is sanya, which means like perception. Yeah, so the way we view things, and he says this is also conditioned and not under our control. And if you think about perception, it's very much conditioned by our views. Yeah, so if we, for example, have a certain view of a person, like this person's a really grumpy, rude person, then our perception will only pick up those things about that person that reinforce that view. Yeah, no matter how much other people may say, well, actually, I get on with that person, I see they can be quite kind. Even when that person approaches us in a kind manner, we've already decided they're, you know, grumpy and, and rude. So we just can't see that. We just can't see that other aspect of the person because our view has already conditioned our perception. Yeah? So we only pick up part of the truth. And the Buddha called perception, like, he likened it to a mirage. You know, when you see, like, the sunlight, not very often in England, but on a road, and it shines down on, say, concrete, and you see this kind of... It looks like water when it's very hot. But when you get closer, it's not water at all. Yeah. But our perception just chooses something that's closest to that. In meditation, it also happens. Sometimes you get things like that seem like lights arising in the mind. When the mind's getting very still, it can start to feel bright. But it's not really a light. It's just that perception's choosing something that's closest to that experience. Some people don't experience light, they experience just a sense of peace or almost like something like cotton wool, something very fine, very subtle. But our perception will choose to interpret it according to whatever we've been conditioned. Yeah. So visual people may see it as a light, more sort of feeling people, feely-feely types may experience it like a feeling like cotton wool in the mind or something like this. Yeah. So our perception can't be trusted and I find this a great relief, you know. One of the things that really helps me when I get stuck in my perceptions is to actually doubt them, yeah. Just doubt that they're telling me the truth. Because as soon as you start to judge something a certain way, everything becomes really tight and narrow, you know. And there's no room to kind of look at it in a different way. And what we can be sure of is as long as these five hindrances are present in our mind, we're not seeing things as they really are, yeah. So I love this teaching because it makes me realize that I've got a choice. I can put down certain perceptions and pick up others. And maybe neither are true, but why not choose the perception that leads to more happiness and peace? Why not choose the perception that's kindest for myself and others? Yeah? So at least this way I'm starting to undermine those hindrances to meditation, the craving, the aversion, the irritation. And as those hindrances are undermined, my perceptions will become more and more reliable, yeah? But still, they're not a self, the Buddha was saying. We can't control them, and they're subject to change, yeah? And then the next one he talked about was sankhara, what we call sankhara, and this is similar to kamma. It's more the active part of the mind that responds or reacts to whatever's arising, yeah? So you've already seen during this retreat, you know, this paradigm of the knower and the known, there's something between there that's, ari that's arising in reaction or response to whatever you're aware of, yeah? And that reaction can be based on, you know, negativity or it can be based on beautiful qualities. You may respond with kindness, with compassion, yeah? With patience, gentleness, forgiveness, or an open-heartedness, yeah? So we have some influence over how we can respond, but unfortunately these... Um, sankharas, he said, these um, reactions can be very strongly conditioned so that we're almost unconscious of the way we respond. Yeah. <clears throat> so he said there's three kinds of people. One person or one type of reaction maybe is like a line chiseled into rock. Yeah. So it's very, very deep and you keep responding in a certain way and every time a similar situation comes up you go straight back to that response because it's been conditioned so heavily into your kind of mental program, yeah? So it's very hard to change. And then the other reaction is like a line drawn on sand. So you draw it into wet sand, for example, and it stays there for a while, but after some time the sand may start to fall in or the water comes and washes it away. And then the other kind, he said, is like a line drawn on water, so it hardly makes any impression at all. You know, the water may part a little bit for a couple of seconds and then it's gone again. But the good news with this, I feel, is um, that is yeah, 
there's a very lovely sutta by the Buddha um, called the simile of the lump of salt. And this is a little bit about, um, one way to interpret it is um, the way that karma arises in the present. Yeah. So what we've already done in the past, you can say is, is over, so we don't have a lot of control over things that have already happened. right? And the things that have already happened will yield certain effects. But what will make the difference is how those effects, what kind of mind those effects arise in. Okay, this might sound a bit complicated, so ask questions if it's not clear. But what the Buddha was saying in this simile was that it's as though you've got a lump of salt. So imagine the lump of salt like the bad actions you've done in the past. So if you put that lump of salt in a glass of water, what happens to the glass of water? That glass of water becomes undrinkable, yeah, because it's just a small container, it's a small volume of water, so it becomes very, very salty. But if you put the same lump of salt in a big lake, can you taste the salt? You know, it's barely discernible because it's entered a very big body of water. And he says in the same way, if those um, effects of your past deeds manifest in a mind which is very small, very tight, narrow, you know, maybe full of aversion, full of negativity, then of course it will have a worse effect because you'll be responding to it with more negativity and just increasing the suffering for yourself. But if it manifests in a big mind, a mind full of compassion, full of loving kindness, patience, acceptance, forgiveness, then that has very, very little impact. And we can see this in our own practice. Like I've noticed where my mind is, you know, has a lot of loving kindness, then things that would normally irritate me really don't. And in fact, I can respond to that person or that situation with a lot of patience, yeah? And even I look at my own past in a different light. You know, if I'm in a bad mood, I might look at my past and think, gosh, how have I got to where I am now? Oh, it's all gone wrong because of this, that happened, and then this happened. And you remember all the things that kind of reinforce this story that your life's gone the wrong direction. But when you're in a good mood, it's totally different. You remember different things, yeah? And you make a completely different picture of your life. Apparently there's some research that was done on um, people in pain towards the end of their lives. And it was found that those people who had really intense but acute pain, so it didn't last so long, would still have um, generally happier memories than the people who had less pain but chronic pain. That tended to influence the mind to become more negative over time and to actually interpret their life in a, in a, in a dimmer light. Yeah, than the people who had even quite severe pain that only lasted a short time. Which is really interesting, because it shows that even if something is very kind of impacting, if your mind is generally full of really good qualities, it won't have like a lasting negative effect. Yeah? So this is one of the beauties of practicing things like compassion and loving kindness, because it literally expands the mind. The Buddha said the mind becomes exalted, immeasurable, boundless, and this is what he meant. So we're resourced and the things, the difficulties, even the results of past actions, they don't have such a bad impact. Forgiveness is another one that can ameliorate some of those um, effects. Yeah. Even if things are arising and we feel terrible about them, we can forgive ourselves for that or forgive other people. And I think this teaching on non-self, the idea that we're conditioned processes, you know, in a way... Sometimes we don't have much of a choice of how we react. You know, any parent will know that despite the best of their intentions to parent their child and maybe not wanting to make the mistakes their mother did, they have some of that conditioning. You know, they've seen certain ways of being and that becomes the first kind of line of behaviour for them too. It's almost unconscious and you can't help that. So we can have a little bit of forgiveness for ourselves, yeah. But also, I think, it's important to surround ourselves by wise friends so that we can have positive influences in our lives as well. Yeah. So knowing that we're conditioned helps us in a way to choose the kind of conducive conditions that we need to grow. Yeah. And it also helps when the meditation is not progressing. It helps me to realize it's not a personal flaw or failing. You know, it's just that maybe the conditions aren't right just now. 
And you can test this out, you know, sometimes you're in one particular lifestyle or at a very busy time in your life, or even in a particular place where you're not really thriving. But then if you move somewhere else where you feel very loved and accepted, very safe, you'll find things start to settle and the meditation takes off. So the Buddha acknowledged that. He didn't say just stay in any situation. You should be able to deal with it no matter what. He actually said if the wholesome qualities are not increasing and the unwholesome ones are increasing, then leave a place. Yeah. Not overnight. Actually, in that sort of he does say don't stay even for a day. And I think, you know, in some cases that's true, right? If you're in an abusive relationship or something like this, it's good to leave as soon as possible when you feel supported enough to do so. But, yeah, generally speaking, it's a, it's a long-term thing, but you have to see whether the wholesome qualities are increasing or not and then make adjustments in your life. So rather than blaming yourself, like, I should be dealing with this better, sometimes there are conditions that are just not as conducive as others, right? Yeah. I mean, I know that now at the moment, I'm in a very busy period of my life. I can't expect to get into deep meditation every day. You know, It's not possible. But I know that that will change when the conditions change. And in the meantime, I can be developing different aspects of the path. You know, still practicing in meditation, but also giving emphasis to other aspects and giving myself to that, trusting the process, you know, letting go into serving. So that's a very lovely way to um, understand conditionality and to kind of come out of this horrible pattern of self-blame, yeah? this inner tyrant who's always down on you and wanting yourself to do better basically expecting far too much. And then the last one is um, what the Buddha called vijnana, which means consciousness. Yeah. And actually there are six consciousnesses. Sometimes people think consciousness means awareness or means the mind. But actually consciousness too is a process. And the Buddha actually said it would be better to regard the body as a self than to regard the mind as a self because the body persists for between, you know, a few months and a hundred years, or even longer. But the mind, he said, is changing every moment by day and by night, incessantly. He said, mind, consciousness, and uh, mentality, so that's citta, mano, and vijnana, are changing incessantly, every moment, many, many times in every moment. You know, when the mindfulness gets really strong, people can see that. They can see this very fast arising and passing of, of consciousness. And he was using consciousness and mind and mentality as synonyms in this particular um, sutta. So how can we regard our mind as a self? You know, we have no control really over it. It's so fleeting. Yeah? And it's a conditioned process. So I think this is very freeing and very liberating. Because we realize that things are going to change. Even if you're not in a good mental state now, it's not going to last. It's going to pass through. And the less we cling to that and make an issue of that, the easier it is for ju it just to pass away. Yeah. So sometimes we have to just loosen our grip on experience. Yeah. So the way it helps me in my meditation, I guess, straight away, is to stop being such a control freak. Because as I say, you know, it's about putting the causes in place and, and experiencing the results of those and sometimes making mistakes. You put the wrong cause in place and you realise, oh, actually, I got tighter through that. I didn't get more peaceful. So we have to experiment, yeah? Stop controlling the process and, and take the sort of passive approach, be like a passive um, backseat driver rather than the one in charge. Yeah. There was this very nice little simile that Ajahn Brahm gave about, uh, it was a joke, I think, in, a, in an in-flight magazine, and the pilot said, oh, in the um, aeroplanes of the future, there'll be just two people, two beings in the uh, pilot seat. One will be the pilot, and his job is just to sit there. Oh, actually, no. One will be the dog, and the dog's job is to bite the pilot any time the pilot touches the controls. Mm -hmm. And the pilot's job is just to feed the dog. <laughs> Which basically means the pilot just sits in the cockpit with his legs up and looks out of the window with the little clouds passing by and the stars twinkling. So I use that as a little uh, reflection, a little um, perception of non-self during my retreat. I imagine myself in this cockpit and this dog next to me that wasn't biting me, it was just giving me a, a little gentle nozzle every time I interfered with the breath or interfered with my mind. And that was quite helpful, yeah. Another way that I was um, imagining it was 
yesterday I spoke about um, how we can sometimes imagine um, a benevolent being sort of pouring out their love towards us, right? If we feel that we need to have a kickstart on compassion or just tune up to the qualities of loving kindness, it can be helpful to imagine someone who represents those things to us. So I was sitting, sort of picturing them in front, behind and to either side of myself and just pouring all their love into me and that really helped me to get the compassion going. But another um, reflection I had was this perception of non-self and I was like, okay, if this is just a process and it's and I'm completely conditioned, you know, then I can just sit here and you can do it for me. So I just imagined my teachers there, you know, giving me all the instructions that I needed and all I have to do is sit there and let the process unfold. It sounds a little bit um, vague, maybe, but for me it was really helpful because I do believe that you know everything, all the wisdom that we acquire is through others, basically, through our experience, but through the conditioning of wise friendships, through our teachers, through the books that we read, through the Buddhist suttas. Yeah? And the Buddha said that wise friendship is the whole of the holy life. That means the whole of spiritual life. Uh, there was a reason for that, and that is because we're conditioned entirely by what's around us and the influences around us. Even newspapers and stuff condition us to see the world in a certain way, as we all know, especially in England, especially through the tabloid press. You know, someone who reads the Daily Mail has a totally different worldview than someone who reads The Guardian, isn't it? <laughs> and if they didn't beforehand, they will do afterwards. That's why the media have such power and control. So even newspapers can be a wise friend or not such a wise friend. You have to decide for yourself what helps you, <laughs> what leads you in a good direction. So another way that this uh, understanding of non-self really helps is in realizing that meditation is a causal process. And there's a sutta in, I think, the Samyutta Nikaya called the Upanissa Sutta. And it's actually called Meditation is a Natural Process or something like that. And it's another version of dependent origination. So dependent origination is the Buddha's teaching on how suffering arises. Yeah? And this one is sometimes called transcendental dependent liberation because it starts from suffering and takes you out of suffering. Right? We haven't got a lot of time to go into it, but just in brief, um, this whole chain of freedom, basically, taking you from suffering to freedom starts with suffering itself and to me that is so such a relief you know because when I was younger I I was really suffering and I couldn't really give a particular reason for that but I knew it was important I knew it was real and I felt there must be a reason you know for why people suffer so when I first heard the Buddha talk about the noble truths that suffering is a reality and it's to be understood and there's a cause and there's a way out that made total sense, and I started to see my suffering as something that could actually be a positive thing in my life, you know, because this could really be, um, it could activate the wish to find freedom. Yeah. If I would never suffer, then what would be the need to come out of suffering? Right? I still meet people who say, I don't suffer, I don't need to meditate. But when we realize that we do suffer, even if it's not very obvious gross suffering, but even the fact that we're not always contented and at peace, This is a kind of suffering, you know, and there's a way out of that. So the Buddha said when we see this suffering, it activates a wish to be free and confidence can arise, yeah? And he said you don't need to make a a volition from confidence that joy arises because it's natural for somebody who has confidence in the teachings that joy starts to arise. So how does that happen? Well, first of all, we realize there is a way out and that there's a possibility for us to, in a way, become an agent in our own happiness, in our own freedom. We don't have to be a victim of what happens to us in life. We have some ability to ameliorate the effects of our karma, of our actions, you know, and to move in a more wholesome direction towards the end of suffering. And also with confidence, I think it's lovely in the Buddha's teaching because he's not asking us to believe blindly in anything. He's actually saying, here are the teachings, try it out. If it works, accept it. If you find it's beneficial to you and others, accept it. If not, put it down, you know, try something different. And so this confidence is something that can be verified. You know, at first it takes a little bit of a leap of faith. We have confidence and trust 
that perhaps if what I already did worked, perhaps this instruction might also work. You know, If the Buddha said this and it did lead to that result, then maybe if he says this, it'll lead to this result. So we have a little bit of a leap of faith, but then it can be verified. And at this point, the path becomes just so wonderful when you start to see real changes in your life. You know? And so the joy starts to arise and we have all the motivation to practice the path and to commit ourselves to a life of virtue, yeah? a life of kindness and goodness and service. And from joy, he says, once joy starts to arise in the mind, there's no need to make a volition. May piti arise, and piti is like rapture, like the very pleasant feelings that can come through the body and mind when you start to get interested in your meditation. So when we start with this joy, you know, from our virtuous life and through our confidence in the teachings, it becomes quite easy to enjoy the practice. And with the PT, when that starts to arise, it kind of sticks the mind to the breath. You become really interested in the object, really interested in your practice. And it becomes fairly effortless to stay with the object, whether the body, whether even difficult emotions, it starts to become easier to be with them. And we find that our mind is opening to them and we're becoming at ease in their presence. Yeah? So this PT, this joy starts to arise, rapture. And from rapture, he says, there's no need to make the volition, may tranquility arise, because it's natural that when you have this pleasure, this happiness in the body and mind, which is a very wholesome kind of happiness, it's natural that after some time it settles down. And often that only settles down when you've really had your fill. Yeah. Sometimes at this point of PT, there can be some resistance to it, especially if we have kind of a low self-esteem or some sort of guilt and we think we don't quite deserve it you know then you notice I know for myself sometimes it can arise quite strongly and I think okay okay that's enough for now you know (laughs) and somehow the mind wants to withdraw from it because it doesn't feel quite ready or maybe it doesn't feel quite deserving of it but after a while if you can really allow it in you know just the way we try to allow the difficult emotions in we have to learn to allow the pleasant ones in too and not be afraid of those so after a while when we can do that then we start to become at ease and it starts to settle and then lead into this tranquility of body and mind. And then we can sit for much longer and there's a a really subtle sense of peace and happiness. So from there, he says, you don't need to make any volition, may happiness arise. Again, the words are a little bit strange, but this is sukha in Pali. It kind of means really deep happiness of peace. So the happiness born of letting go and contentment rather than anything that's uh, due to stimulation of the senses. So the senses are actually fading at this point, and this happiness of the mind is starting to take over. And the happiness of the mind is the proximate cause for samadhi to happen. Deep, deep calm and stillness of the jhanas. Yeah? So we can't get into these states without happiness. Happiness is an indispensable part of the path, and it's the proximate cause for the deep states of stillness. So it's a very beautiful path and a natural path. And the whole point of this sutta is that it is a causal process. And we can't rush those causes. We can't manufacture them and make them happen when we want them to. We have to put them in place carefully with a lot of love, a lot of patience, and without expecting results. Which sounds difficult, but I think that's why I really like this idea of letting go and renunciation as a kind of giving because it sort of transforms your relationship with practice. Instead of sitting down to see what I can get, we sit down to see what we can give. What we can give to the mind, to the breath, to the emotions, even if it's just our presence. Sometimes I imagine that I'm just sitting down as a gift to the Buddha. No. Just the fact that I'm sitting there, it doesn't matter what happens, even if my mind's agitated, I just give some of my time out of respect to the Buddha, out of respect to my teachers, and also out of respect to myself, just to give my mind that space to rest without any expectation. And the reason this samadhi is so important on the path is that this is the first time the hindrances are really overcome. So the Buddha said that as long as the hindrances are there, you don't get into deep meditation, and they can invade the mind and remain. So they just keep coming, you know. Even if they go away for a while, they're not fully overcome. But when you do get into these deep states, then 
you're free from those hindrances and you actually have a chance to see things as they really are. So in Pali he said, samadhi pachya yata bhutanyana dasana, which means from samadhi one sees things as they truly are. And it's because those hindrances are absent. Yeah? So it's not that insight arises in the state of samadhi. The insight can arise in the sense of how to overcome the hindrances and how to deepen the samadhi, but it's a result of samadhi that we're able to see clearly. And the mind is very soft, very malleable, it's free from judgment, free from any kind of predilection about what I want to see or what I don't want to see. So it's open to see something that perhaps you haven't seen before, you know, deeper truths of impermanence and non-self and suffering. Because yeah. we all have a sense of that, but obviously we haven't penetrated it deeply enough or we'd be really free, really free from suffering. Yeah. And the other thing that the mind is at that point is very steady, very, very steady and, and penetrative. So it can see much more deeply into things than a mind that's you know, constantly jumping from past to future, or restlessness to sleepiness. You know? So at this point we're really poised to go deeper and have deeper insight into the practice. And the whole process is a process of letting go, not a process of attaining anything. Yeah. I think it was Ajahn Chah who said, if you get, let go a little bit, you get a little bit of happiness. If you let go a lot, you get a lot of happiness. If you let go completely, guess what you get? <laughs> you get complete happiness. Yeah? And that's the happiness of freedom, not the happiness of accumulation and acquiring and attainment. So it's a very beautiful path, and we can start by just noticing the little happinesses along the way. You know, it's, it's helpful, I find, just to reflect on something that does bring uplift to your mind at the beginning of your meditation. You know, reflecting on the fact that you found the Dhamma, that you have a chance to practice, that you have certain qualities you know, that have brought you to the Dhamma and that you want to cultivate. You know, even if you haven't cultivated them completely yet, you have this beautiful wish to bring more kindness, more love, more compassion into the world and into your relationship with yourself and other beings. And that's really, really admirable. You know, that's not the normal kind of worldly wish. When the mother says to the child, you know, what do you want to be when you get older? It's always like a teacher or a doctor or an engineer or something. <laughs> but what about I want to be kind? Yeah, That's not really valued, is it? Not enough. <laughs> and yet that's what really makes the difference. So the whole practice, I was reading a little post yesterday <laughs> on social media and it was trying to argue that compassion wasn't a key tenet of the Buddha's teachings, that it was only sort of discussed in, in small areas of the Buddhist teachings. And I totally disagree with that because to me it starts from the very motivation as to why we practice in the first place. You know, understanding that all beings suffer all beings desire happiness and recoil from pain. They're the exact words in the Pali Canon. And that is the motivation for practicing virtue, you know, body, speech and mind. So everything is based on this, not a sense of what I want to get out of it and you know, spiritual materialism. So it's very, it really undermines that, that sort of tendency that I think everybody has and it's understandable. You know, of course we want happiness, we can't pretend otherwise. But we have to go about it in a different way. Instead of grasping, we have to learn to just let go, let go, let go, and give our trust to our mind, looking in a different direction. Yeah? So it's like a rebellion. We're a rebel from the usual ways of seeking happiness, and we start to look inside instead. Yeah. Very good. So. So, for those who weren't here yesterday... I'll just um, 